Hello everyone, I'm Ashley Clayton, a Senior Research Specialist here at Longwood Gardens, and one of my responsibilities is caring for our Clivea collection. So today I'm going to talk about our Clivea breeding program. So I want to start off by answering the number one question I get on this topic, and that is how do you pronounce the name? Is it Clivea or Clivia? Well, the name actually comes from a person's name. John Lindley, a Kew botanist, described and named the first species of the Clivea after the Duchess of Northumberland, Lady Charlotte Clive who cultivated and flowered the type specimen in England. Now, I was taught that if the plant name comes from a person's name, you keep the pronunciation of that person's name. So you will hear me say Clivea. However, there are no absolute rules when it comes to pronouncing botanical nomenclature. So whether you say Clivea or Clivia, both are perfectly fine. The genus Clivea is in the Emerald Daisy family. It has six species, Clivea gardenii, Collescens, Mirabilis, Nobilis, Robusta, and Miniata. And all six of these are endemic to Southern Africa, which means that's the only place where they'll be found naturally growing. Now you'll notice that one of these looks a little bit different from the rest. That's because most of the species have these tubular flowers that hang down because they're pollinated by sunbirds. And these sunbirds are able to hold onto the scape of the inflorescence and with their long curved beaks reach up into the flowers to get nectar. Whereas Clavia miniata has these more open and upright flowers because they're pollinated by butterflies. These larger, more open flowers have made Clivea miniata the more desirable species of the Clivea in terms of the horticulture room. So when I say Clivea, I'm specifically referring to Clivea miniata. The story of the Clivea begins back in the 1800s when botanists were exploring South Africa. The first collection of Clivea was made by William Birchall in 1815, and that was of Clivea nobilis. In 1820s, plants were being sent back to England for cultivating and studying. And then in 1828, John Lindley described and named the genus Clivea. Now at this time, there was certainly some interest in the plants because it was something new to the botanical world, but it wasn't until 1850s that the big discovery of Clivea miniata was found. And these plants became an instant pop, one of the most popular house plants within England and other parts of Europe, because they have these large, bright orange showy flowers, glossy evergreen leaves, and they are well suited for being a house plant, as I will describe later. They gained even more popularity in 1888 when the first yellow flower in Clivea was found. And these were extremely rare. So this fueled an interest for breeders and collectors that have still persisted today. Because even decades later, yellow Clivea were still rare. Most of the Clivea on the market were orange flowering and there were some yellow flowers, but they weren't really of high quality. Either the plant had a poor habit and would flop over or they would have very few flowers or the flowers were small. So to address this, in 1976, Dr. Robert Armstrong started the Clivea breeding program with the goal of producing a yellow Clivea with very large flowers and an upright habit. To start the program, we needed our own yellow Clivea for the genetics. Now we didn't go to South Africa and make any collections. Instead, we either purchased the plants in from breeders or growers like Gordon McNeil in South Africa or Glasshouse Works in Ohio, or plants were generously donated to us by local residents, uh, for example, Richard Bryan and Sir John Turan. In fact, Sir John Turan's yellow clivea already had a reputation in this region because he would gift a few of his clivea to friends and they would often enter them into the Philadelphia Flower Show where they would win a blue ribbon. This was also the plant that inspired Delaware Center for Horticulture's first rare plant auction where the plant uh, auctioned off for $1,700 in 1981. So when Longwood received plants of this yellow Clivea, we worked with White Flower Farm to propagate it and release it to the public. And we named it after the donor in his honor. So it is called Sir John Turan. And it is a beautiful yellow Clivea. It has these small star-shaped flowers and a great upright habit. So we were very fortunate to have this to use in our, as genetics for our breeding. So the breeding Clivea is an endeavor in patience. It takes several years before you can see the results of even just one cross. It starts off by carefully selecting the parents and we'll take a paintbrush and we'll collect the pollen from one flower and we'll place it on the stigma of either the same flower or a different flower. And if pollination is successful, very shortly, berries should start to form. And these berries are actually quite ornamental in themselves. If you have orange flowering plants, the berries will turn dark red. If you have yellow flowers, the berries will turn yellow. And if you're lucky and you have a variegated plant, your berries might even be variegated. And these are true berries, so that means there's multiple seeds within each of these fruits. And so it takes about eight to 10 months before they color and ripen. And so at that time, then we would collect the seeds, um, clean the fruit off of them, and then sow them in a soilless medium like vermiculite. And after about a month, they'll germinate. That's the fastest part of this whole process. 
The next step is in growing them onto maturity. The Clivio plants will grow about two to four leaves every year, and the magic number is 12. Once you have 12 leaves, then the plant is mature and can flower the following year. However, the first time it blooms is not a good representation of that plant's true potential. A lot of times the first inflorescence will have few flowers or very small flowers, but as the plant grows and gets more robust and has more energy, the inflorescences tend to improve as well. So we usually wait until about the third or the fourth bloom to say this is what the flowers really look like for this plant. So if the, flower, if the plant blooms about once every year, then that adds on two to three years to this breeding timeline. So then once we have a flowering plant, and if it's something that we feel we should um, release, then the next step is to make more of them because only having one doesn't do much good. We need to have more to be able to plant into our gardens and to also offer for sale. Now we can't grow them from seed because that's how you have genetic variation. So instead we have to wait for the mother plant to produce these offsets as pictured here. So those small leaves are actually connected to the rhizomatous base of that larger plant. And so we'll wait till those grow large enough that they can be divided. So usually once they have four to six leaves and then we'll just separate them from the mother plant like you would an iris and pop them up separately. So you can see now that this whole timeline can take at least eight years for just one um, release. Now, however, we were breeding for yellow flowers, which adds another layer of complexity to this story. So we started our first crosses by taking those yellow flowering clavia that we either purchased or donated to us, and we crossed them with this really nice orange flowering clavia that had large open orange flowers and a very good habit. And all of the offspring from that cross were orange flowers. So then we did two different types of crosses. We did a back cross where we took one of those orange flowering offsprings and back crossed it with the yellow flowering parent. And then we also did a sibling cross where we crossed two of the orange flowering offsprings. And from those crosses, we did get some yellow flowering clivia. Not all of them, but we did get some. And so this provided evidence that yellow flowers um, is controlled by a recessive gene, which just meant that it was gonna take more time and um, more crosses to produce yellow flowering clivia as opposed to orange flowers, which makes sense for how naturally rare it is. So with all this in mind, now you can understand why it took at least 35 years before we made our first introduction. So in 2011, we introduced Clivia along with debutante. It was chosen for its large flowers, its round petals that overlapped. It has a very full umbel, an upright habit, and most importantly, bright buttery yellow flowers. But we didn't stop there. The next year, we actually had a second yellow clive to release, this time along with fireworks. This one has creamy yellow flowers. And what's really spectacular is its umbel is a near perfect sphere. And it has these reflex petals or petals that curl back. And so what that does is really make the stamens pop out of the flowers like a spray of fireworks. Now, while our breeding program was focused on creating yellows, which we were doing, we were still keeping an eye out for any new novel features that were popping up. Because when you have a breeding program, you really never know what you might get. So for example, we started seeing this ruffle uh, appear on some of the petals that would go down the middle. And it was really interesting because it added a texture and depth to Clivia that wasn't there before, kind of similar to multi-petal flowers. And so we referred to this phenomenon as keeling in reference to the keel of a boat. And so keeling was relatively rare and seemed to pop up randomly in crosses, but through our breeding efforts, we were able to create a consistently keeling plant, not only across the petals, but across all the flowers. It was released in 2014 under the name Longwood Sunrise because of its bright orange and yellow flowers. So at this point in the story, now yellows are a little more common. And so breeders and collectors were looking for uh, new colors. And the next new color was red. That was the color to have. And so as we evaluated our crosses, we found this phenomenal plant with flowers that had a complex blend of bronzes, burnt oranges, and dark red overtones. And it has a small green throat. And as the flowers age, they even become a darker red. And so we released it in 2016 with the name Longwood Chimes. And to this day, it's still one of my favorite clavia. So the following year, we actually had another color breakthrough. This time it was a salmon colored clivia, which placed it in the pastel category for clivia. The soft hues of Longwood Sunset are contrasted with a bright yellow and white throat, and each petal is subtly lined by a red orange picky tea. And not only was this a new color to our collection, but these flowers are the largest of our clivia, measuring up to about four to five inches across those reflex petals. It really reminds you of an emerald. 
And lastly, our latest release was one of the most anticipated within Longwood because ornamental green flowers are extremely rare in the plant world. This these flowers are very similar to debutante in that they are large and overlapping, but they are creamy green and have a lime green throat. We released this one in 2019 at the Philadelphia Flower Show where we asked guests to help us name it. Over 11,000 votes were cast and the winner was Longwood Wintergreen. Now we're no longer actively breeding Clivia, but we still have over 100 plants from previous crosses and we're still looking to see if there's anything novel to release. So what are examples we're looking for next? Well, one example are vibrant green throats because they lend a very nice contrast to the warm colors of the rest of the petal. We're also looking for flowers in the pastel category. So like peaches and apricots, the lighter it can be, the more it'll contrast with those dark green leaves. We're also looking for petals that have patterns to them. So for example, this is a photo of what would be considered Piketty, where a lot of that warm red orange color is pushed to the edge of the flowers. Or another pattern I'm really interested in finding would be something called ghosting. And that's where actually the pigment is missing, but it's in a uniform manner across the petals. And then lastly, we're also looking for unusual forms. So for example, like a spider form clavia where the petals are very thin or a multi-petal, whereas clavia typically have six petals, we might find eight or more. Now a breeding program produces hundreds of plants, but only a few get selected for release. So you might be thinking, what do we do with the rest of our plants? Well, we either plant them in the gardens or we offer them in the garden shop. That means you can buy a unique one-of-a-kind clavia from our breeding program. We typically sell them in March when our clivey are in bloom, and we'll have selections of oranges and yellows, along with some of our Longwood introductions like debutante and sunset. And if you have any reservations about trying to grow clivea, do not worry, because as I mentioned before, they are one of the easiest houseplants you can grow, but emphasis on houseplants. Unless you live in California, I do not recommend you plant them outside. Clivea will not uh, live below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. As for light, in their native habitat, they do live on the forest floor, so these are shade plants. So if you keep them inside, I would place them somewhere they get bright, but indirect light. So we say if you can read a newspaper, that's enough light for them. Or you can place your containerized clavia outside during the summer, but just make sure that it's somewhere protected and won't get direct light. Otherwise, the leaves will scorch very quickly. For the soil, you want to use a well-draining and very coarse mix. So normal potting mix will not work, it's too dense. However, you can use that as a base and amend it to lighten it up by adding perlite, or a lot of times cactus mixes or orchid mixes work well for clavia. In fact, if you've grown orchids, you know that they have these very fleshy roots because they grow up in trees and they need to be able to hold on to any kind of water that um, hits that tree. Well, clivia actually have the exact same anatomical root structure, but it's not because they grow in trees. They actually grow, again, on the forest floor, but they grow in very rocky soil and a very shallow layer of organic material. So they also don't have any material around them to hold on to moisture, so the roots have adapted to provide that function. What that means is these are very drought tolerant plants and you won't have to water them very often. So we say wait until the top two to three inches of your potting mix is dry and then thoroughly water it until water comes out of the bottom of the pot. And a good rule of thumb is if in doubt, don't water it. As for fertilizer, I do recommend fertilizing during its active growing period. So that would be between April and October. You can either use a soluble fertilizer at half strength or top dress with a six month slow release. And then lastly for repotting, you won't have to repot them very often because one, they're slow growing, but two, they actually like their roots pretty uh, crowded. In fact, I'm guilty of waiting for my personal clivia to break their pots before I repot them. But in general, you can wait between three and five years to repot them. Now I started off by answering the number one question I get. And so I'll end by answering the number two question. And so a lot of times clavia owners will ask me, why is my clavia not flowering? Now it's very, very easy to care for and have a healthy evergreen uh, foliage clavia all year round, but it does take a little bit of effort to get them to flower because these are spring blooming plants in their native habitat. And like most spring flowering plants, they need to go through some kind of winter in order to initiate a bloom because that's how they know that it's spring is that it's no longer winter. The problem is our winters are too wet and too cold, so we have to find a way to simulate a South African mild winter. So this is a schedule we follow here at Longwood. So from April to October is their active growing season. They are producing new roots. The leaves are emerging and actively photosynthesizing. And so this is when you'll water and fertilize, like I mentioned before. 
As for temperatures, whatever it is outside or in your house is perfectly fine. And then around mid to late October is when the plants will start to go dormant. Now you won't actually see any physical changes because again, the leaves are evergreen, so they won't die back. However, physiologically, the plant is no longer actively growing. So what I do is I withhold all water from again, late October to about mid January, unless the plant is really wilting, but I try very hard not to have to water them. And then the real key is to reduce the temperature to between 55 degrees and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The closer you can get it to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the better chance you're gonna have a consistent bloom. But I do know people who can only get their temperatures down to 55 and it has worked just fine for them. So examples of where you can place your clivia at this time when they're dormant is either maybe an attached garage, a basement or an attic, somewhere where I can get chilled, but there's no risk of it freezing. So then in mid-January is when I start waking up the clivia so that they'll start initiating their flowering. I'll water them with just normal water, no fertilizing at this time, and then slowly raise the temperature to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I typically do this over a week period to gradually wake them up. So about two or three degrees, I'll raise it each day. And about two weeks after this process, you'll start to see buds form down at the base of the leaves in between them. And then six weeks after that, you will have gorgeous clivia blossoms. And that is the secret to growing a clivia. So thank you very much for joining me. If you want to learn more about a clivia or a breeding program, we do have posts at our website. We also will uh, post our estimated date of when we the Clydea will be flowering. The photos are nice, but I highly encourage you to visit them in person. Thank you.